So I'm gonna call on the ever beautiful young mom, Leigh Escobar. Thank you very much for that very humbling <laughs> introduction. Um, thank you, Sister Emma. Just before I proceed and go on, I'd like to show you a video just to honor moms. Because I know this is our this is our day, correct? We've celebrated Mother's Day last week, but it's we can make everyday Mother's Day, don't you think so? I'll just show this video quickly. <laughs> that, hey, 
If you want to learn more about how to be a mother after God's own heart, how to raise your children to love the Lord as well, it's really where the Bible is, where we can really get those principles from. So I'll be talking to you about that. I'll just show you this quote. It says, you cannot change your ancestors, but you can do something about your descendants. Correct? Yeah, we can really do something, anything about the past, past is done, but we can do something about the future, what's ahead. And in fact, when we do influence our descendants, it actually can pass on from generation to generation. So that's what we're here tonight. Um, I've been introduced, so I just thought I'd show you a picture of, for some of you who don't know me yet, I have two, two girls, um, Zoe, who's turning six in July, and Eva's turning three. And of course, I'm married to a beautiful, handsome man. <laughs> me so, thank you um, but really you might think you know I'm, I'm really a young mom and I'm speaking to all even older mothers than me so what right do I have to speak but again I said I, I'll be speaking from the Bible and the principles which you can all learn from in fact as I was preparing this message God was actually convicting me I was like you know there are things there that I'd be like oh Lord I've not done that I needed to improve on this but there are also some principles there that God's been encouraged me later you're on the right path so I guess that's where I'll be speaking from. But also, I'll be speaking from the heart of speaking as a daughter myself. Um, as you see, you know, we can learn principles and we can also learn from others' mistakes, correct? Um, as some of you know and some of you probably don't know, I've actually been raised in a in a dysfunctional family. My parents separated when I was nine. So technically you can say I'm not really raised. I wasn't really raised by my parents. Hence my mother, because she left when I was nine. So there were a lot of influences in my life that have actually made me to the kind of person I am today. But ultimately, despite that, God was the one who really looked after me. And I'm going to talk about that all the way through in my message tonight. So that's really where I'm coming from. I'm talking to you as a young mom, but I'm also speaking to you as a daughter who has learned a lot from my past and you know how God has restored me and my family. All right, so I'm just gonna go through this quickly. You know, there are different styles of parenting. Um, one of which is helicopters. I'm like hovering, very overprotective. But sometimes it becomes, the children becomes um, what, distant or maybe dependent and maybe even insecure. So these are just some parenting styles of the, what that we're doing. Um, Child-centric where, you know, kids get spoiled. So hence, um, kids so can be very entitled, you know, like, oh, I need this, I need that. I deserve that. So there's also the buddy-buddy system or parenting where you're just peers. We're just cool, we're chill, okay? But the effect of that sometimes, children could be disrespectful of parents. Um, other one is passive. Passive is basically not available. So if kids, uh, parents are not available, similar to what I've experienced, children can become insecure. And that's what I've been. I became very insecure. Dictatorial, yeah, you know that. No, don't do this. You know, very strict. Um, children can become rebellious and become, they even leave the house. Um, abusive, either physically or verbally, also has its effect. Um, it could be that they distrust authority, right? But what we wanted to talk about today is heart parenting. Would you like to learn that? Yes. We really need to parent really from the heart, right? Because God said so. It's really hard not to be able to influence your children if we don't have their hearts, okay? So why focus on the heart, you'd say? If I go to, um, this Bible verse in 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So really the Bible is actually saying God looks first at the hearts. But really pair up mothers, it begins with our own hearts, right? Because if we are not able to look after our hearts, how can we give something that we do not have? Because if we are to influence the heart of our children and able to parent them by touching their hearts and being able to influence them from the heart, it really begins with us. So this is what actually um, the Bible also says. Basically, yeah, God is concerned about the heart, but most parenting styles would focus on the exterior, isn't it? Behavior, you know, what you see in your children. But really, God is saying, no, you focus on the heart. So Deuteronomy 6, 5, 7 is a very popular verse. Probably some of, the, some of you have not heard of this yet. But I'll ask you to please read it together. Ready, go. So the 
Bible is saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall put this on your heart. So basically, God is talking to us mothers. You have to put this on your heart. You have to love me first and foremost. And then as you do that, and as you have realized your, that my love for you, and that, I, you know, that you love me, then you need to pass it on to your children. How? When you, what? When you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up, basically any time of day, right? So it has to be really intentional. So that's basically what God is saying. It really begins with our heart. So how do we nurture our hearts as mothers? How do we, how do we take, care of, take care of our hearts? So when God is saying to love Him, how do we do that? Maybe you coming here today is already one step forward to getting to know God more. Um, of course, we have the Bible as a reference. You can read that. You can go to church. You can have women around you, surround, surrounded by women who knows the Bible, who can actually also encourage you to actually walk alongside. Because it's always good to be with women friends, isn't it? Because there are things when you can you can share your struggles and you're like, oh, I'm glad I'm not alone. You know, it's always good to hear stories that we're actually in the same path. So today I have eight points that we're going to talk about on how we can influence our children for God. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready to motivate your children to reach their God-given potential? Yes. To be able to love God and serve Him with Christ-like character? Yes, I see some resounding yes, so let's start. Okay, first off, the law of modeling. It's not modeling, <laughs> per se. But modeling, really what modeling is, children copy us either positively or negatively. Do you agree? Yes. I think the very first time when I remember my kids, because you would often be on the phone, especially in my work, I'm in sales, so I talk a lot on the phone, and I see my, remember my daughter's getting the remote control, talking on the phone, copying me, laughing hard, as if, you know, they're talking to someone, but they're really just copying me. Um, so there's really a very, in, you know, important, modeling is really a, an effective way of teaching. But other than that, it can also mean, you know, if you're not doing the right thing, they can also copy that. Um, Eva, my youngest daughter, at one point, I saw her playing with her dolls, okay? So she was playing with her dolls, I saw her scolding the doll. And this is how she was scolding the doll. No, no, you're not supposed to do that. And I looked at her and I go, oops, that's a wake up call. Because she's really copying what I was doing to her, right? So I was doing that. So I'm like, okay, Lord, I think that's a, that's a wake up call to me. It's my approach. And then, but another, at another time, I saw her playing with her dolls again. But this time, she was cuddling the doll, hugging and kissing, feeding, putting on blanket. And I realized I do that a lot to her, especially I'm a touchy mother. I love hugging and kissing. So I see that with Eva. So I thought, okay, that's a good thing. So really, um, values are caught, they're not taught. It says, you actually speak so loudly, I can't hear what you're, hear what you're saying. So they really copy us. So it's really important how we model. Uh, model is the most effective way, it should be a lifestyle. But also mothers, I just want to encourage you, it's not about perfection, because we're not perfect. Are we perfect? No. No, almost, but <laughs> we're not perfect. But what we're saying here, modeling is authenticity. So for example, if you've made mistakes, you did some behaviors and probably your children that you think are not, quite modeling, you know, quite enough to be modeled. Um, I think the way we can be authentic is to just say, hey, I'm sorry mom did that. Um, and we can just be as honest to them and ask forgiveness. So that's also modeling, okay? The other way we can model, especially for those um, with husbands, you know, husbands and wives, for us as wives um, is to also model the biblical role of marriage, right? So as wives, if we want our children to love and respect their father and even love and learn to love and respect other people, they need to see that we do that with our husbands, that we love and respect them. But similarly, the husbands, the fathers, you know, they have their role is to love us, you know, to lead us. So they do need to see that because the best gift we can ever give our children is that they see their parents loving each other. And that's something I've, I've, I've longed for, something I've prayed for, you know, growing up at nine and not being able to see that. Sometimes I got confused with how marriage is or, but this is something I'm learning that this is really what God has asked us to do. So model Christ-likeness in the power of the Holy Spirit. On our own, can we do it, ladies? Can we really model this? It's hard, right? So really without the help of God, which is why we're looking through the Bible to help us, is really without God's help, we cannot do it. And Christ-likeness, 
It's just as an example of Jesus. Jesus talked about it in Philippians 2, 3 to 8, right? Like, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, being made in likeness of men. He, he found himself becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So basically, he's like, selfless humility to the point of death. So as mothers, we put our husbands first. We put our children first. I know it's hard. And of course, we pray that our husbands, right, support us in this journey of parenting. Um, yep. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. This is the fruit of the Spirit that we can model. But this is the sovereign truth. You must be what you want your children to be because they will become what you are. Correct? True? Yeah. Um, you know, there's actually, just for your information, there's actually a book exactly entitled A Mom After God's Own Heart. And this is by Elizabeth George. I read through it. She was actually pointing out 10 points here. But some of the points she's sharing is really how we can, can become mother after God's own heart. Is first nurture our hearts. And then you talk to your children about God. Let them know about who God is. But also another one that she's emphasized here is take your children to church. Um, maybe you ask why that is, but it's also showing your priorities as a mother, your priorities as a family, that you're actually putting God first, you're allowing them to come to know the Lord. You know, even at a young age, based on statistics, between 0 to 14 is crucial in building the foundation of our children. So if we're able to do that, influence them to love the Lord. You know, when they grow older as teens, it gets harder because there's so many influences. A lot of people influence them to not do this, to not go to church. So us, now that we have that chance, why do we do it? And for older parents, probably you're thinking, but no, my kids are older, they don't want to go to church. Um, don't lose hope, you can pray, and maybe what you can do is share to them how God is speaking to you, how God is transforming you, and they too might be interested and say, I want what my mom wants, I'm gonna go, right? So these are the things that we can do and model to our kids. All right, modeling, next one is open communication. The more you communicate, the more you can influence them. In James 1, 19 to 20, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Communication. Sometimes we think, ah, oh, my kids will never really understand. There's a generation gap. No, it's not a generation gap. It's a communication gap. Maybe we're really not talking. Um, I was actually, I asked the permission of one of the moms here. I had lunch with her sometime two weeks ago, and for some reason, the teenager, her teenage daughter joined us for lunch, and I thought, oh, that was good. So I, I started asking questions and just getting to know, and, and, and the teenage daughter was actually saying, um, yeah, for a while I actually had a boyfriend, and I hid it from my parents because they were very strict, you know, they were always lecturing, so I didn't want to open up to them, and only, the parents only found out about it after they, she's broken up with this boyfriend. And so what she said, and I asked her, so what about now? How are you and your, your parents and your, you know, your, you opening up to them? And she said, you know what? Because I've seen how my parents have changed. They've changed the way they talk to me now. It's not lecturing, they're more listening. I've seen how they've humbled themselves, how they're really growing also knowing the Lord. Um, now it has changed, they're more open. They're more open talking. They said even in their dining table, they actually talk about um, their crushes, you know, even the dad is the one opening up the conversation, you know, like making it very light and making the parents part of the journey. So, yeah, what open communication, the key to that is listen, yeah, because the more you understand, the more you listen, the more you understand. So some practical applications. Make time, don't give busy signals. Um, listen with full attention. Do you find that sometimes mothers, you know, our kids will show us something. Hey, mom, I need to show you something. Yeah, what is it? What is it? Or like looking at the phone, YouTube, or Facebook, and then there's like that's so really not full attention, right? So these are just some practical things that we can do. Um, listen to their heart feelings. Show interest. Ask questions. I believe in asking questions, even at a young age. Sometimes my daughter will not share. So until, until I probe and ask questions. So it's really important to ask questions and also don't lecture. Oh, there's more. Um, do not uh, praise your voice. So I've learned a lot. Um, do not use you always or never because there's really ne always and never, isn't it? Um, share your own struggles and ask how can I pray for you. Are we learning so far? Yes. We're just on the second point. There's a lot. <laughs> Imagine me pre preparing this message like ah ah ah. <laughs> so, but it's good. All good. Um, 
modeling, what's that called? Open communication. Next is time, the law of time. The more you spend quality time with your family, the more you can influence them. This is similarly what Jesus did in the Bible. And he appointed 12 so that they could be with him and he could send them out. So Jesus had 12 disciples. He spent time with them, long time actually, well, three years, to influence them so that they're the ones now discipling the world. So actually, I, I did ask a mother and daughter um, to share with us tonight their story of how God actually moved in their lives. So I want to call Merlin and her daughter, Sarah. I went to Doha, Qatar to work as a nurse with my mom. After two years, I met a local Qatari man. I had a relationship with him, even though my mom didn't approve. We eventually wanted to conceive a child, so I went back to the Philippines to undergo some tests. I successfully got pregnant, but I had to make a big decision to stay in the Philippines to deliver my child. It was heartbreaking because it meant being separated from my boyfriend. On my sixth month of pregnancy, my dermatologist shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. I started attending CCF worship service and Bible studies. I was then connected to a D group. The members were very supportive in my spiritual journey. They guided me during the time that I almost had postpartum depression. I learned about God's command in 2 Corinthians 6.14. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can have light with darkness? It was a struggle for me, but I knew that that was what's best for Sarah. I separated from my boyfriend and I became a hands-on mom for the first two years of my daughter's life. Then an opportunity came for me to work in Singapore. I decided to leave Sarah to my mom. Since then, I would only see her every three months when I go home. I do my best not to miss her birthday and special events. I maximized my time when I was with her. I would Skype with her and practice biblical parenting as much as I can. Good afternoon, I am Sarah, 14 years old. Growing up was a confusing journey. I would live with my grandparents and mommy wasn't there at home most of the time. I also didn't know my father at the young age. At the young age, I noticed that I didn't look like my Filipino family. I would get bullied because I looked different. When my friends asked me if I am half Indian, I would shrug my shoulders because I didn't know where my father was from. Now, uh, no one told me, no one walked. No one was telling me. My grandparents took care of me. When mommy came home every three months, I was very excited. But, she, but when she left, I would cry for about a week. I felt sad whenever she missed my school events and sports tournament. I was jealous of my friends who had their moms and dads, dads having fun with them. I was even teased because my mom wasn't there for me. All this confusion led to become a disrespectful child. I wanted to get the attention that I was lacking. I would sometimes skip, skip class and regularly get called to the principal's office. At night, I would pray and ask God, when are we gonna be complete again? A friend encouraged me to pursue my application to New Zealand. The trans transition was so smooth. After a couple of years, Sarah was able to come here. We were reunited and finally lived together. It was a big adjustment as I was used to living on my own. It was a huge responsibility, balancing work and being a mother. God gave me the opportunity to be together with my daughter and raise her. God fixed my work schedule so I can attend parent-teacher meetings, school events, and netball games. 
I taught her to be independent and be responsible. I brought her to CCF Next Gen Sunday School, and I saw her grow spiritually day by day. Since it was my first time living together in one house, it took me time to adjust and get to know my mom. I've learned so many things from her. She taught me to be independent. She taught me to be respectful. I would, I would, she would discipline me when needed. I would follow my mom because I saw how she modeled what she was teaching me. She was respectful and patient, so I copied her. I also saw how she was faithful to God and how she changed her old ways. So I got interested and I eventually surrendered my life to God too. I am so thankful to God because He continues to work in our lives. He, remind, he reminded us to be strong and to trust in Him. I am not, uh, I, I may not have an earthly father, but I have a heavenly father who never leaves us, never leaves us, nor forsakes us. Today, not only do I have a, not today, I, today, not only do I have restored mother-daughter relationship, but we are the best of friends. <laughs> God makes it possible. I was intentional in spending time with Sarah. I would bring her to my D group. We would travel. We would travel together locally and overseas. We went to theme parks, watched movies, ate in restaurants, and spent quiet moments at home. During the recent visit of Pastor Danny and Grace Paris, I learned about intentional discipleship that begins with family. Uh, so I talked to Sarah and apologized for all the past hurts I've caused. Indeed, saying sorry to her made a big difference in our relationship, and we became very close. I also, I also apologized to my own mother over the phone, and Sarah witnessed me doing it. God is so good. Again, I am Merlin, an imperfect mom that has met, made many mistakes, but I have been forgiven. And I'm a mother after God's own heart. To God be all the glory. Wow. So that's the power of God transforming relationships. And I'm really blessed with it. Um, that God is really in the business of changing lives. And to this day, He's restoring relationships. So thank you, Sarah. And, um, um, yeah, so spending time with our children is really key. The more we spend time, and it's never too late, you know, they got back together, what, how many, just, just how many years ago, but now they're developing their relationship as mom and daughter, and now they're best of friends. How amazing. For children, love is spelled time, T-I-M-E. I remember Zoe, I asked her one time, hey Zoe, what do you like us doing as a family the most? And Zoe just mentioned to me, you know, Mom, I like going to hotels. And to me, when she mentioned that, that meant we just she just likes spending time with us, sleeping in one bed, traveling. And praise God, because fortunately with my work, I get to travel up north and I bring the entire family along. <laughs> so and I thought that's a blessing, because that's what my daughter's my daughter wanted is for us to spend time. So every time we can we do that. So let's view time as an investment, be available for them and look for those magic moments. There's so many magic moments I know moms there is. Take time and nurture that and cherish those magic moments. So that's time. Next one is the law of intimacy. The closer the relationship, the greater the influence. It's true, right? We can only influence someone if we have a close relationship with that someone. So in, in, even in terms of parenting, it's very important because there's so many factors that can influence our children. First Corinthians 15, 33 already said, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. So it's very important that we are the ones influencing our children. So biological relationship does not guarantee good relationship, right? It doesn't mean, you know, I gave birth to you, we should be really close. It's not, it has to be intentional. We have to really take the time and effort to do that. You know, I mentioned earlier that similar to Sarah and, and Merlin, I was actually kind of that way. 
Um, but good thing for them, they actually restored, got restored early on, isn't it? When um, they got together early. But for me, I guess growing up, because you know I was away from my mom, I was also living with grandparents here and there. So there were just so many influences. But I know along that path, God was actually looking after my life. And he was the one who, who restored me personally when I came to know the Lord when I was in my early 20s. So when I came to know Jesus, I, under, I understood the forgiveness of God. And we understood, I understood that God's forgiveness in me. Then I thought about my mom because, you know, I harbored bitterness towards her because she was the one who left. I was nine and seeing my dad devastated. I was like blaming her. It's your fault. You know, this is why I'm like this. My brother's like this. We're, I'm, we're apart. Um, so I grew up harboring that bitterness towards my mom. But then eventually when God, I found the Lord and I, I, I realized God's forgiveness, eventually I forgave my mom as well. And that's something I prayed for, like for me to really show love and to really restore our relationship. But you know, God is the God of second chances, many chances, isn't it? God is the God of hope. And amazingly, of course, my mom also came to know Jesus and, and God restored her relationship. In fact, to this day, you know, God is still restoring our relationship. Because before, there was a feeling of being awkward. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have a relationship with her, so therefore sometimes, what do I talk about? You know, what, what, should, what can I open up to her? You know, I'm really not used to it. But then, you know, it was God. Has God changed me and God changed her. You know, right now, there are times when I talk to her and we talk on Skype or FaceTime. And I was just staring, sharing to her what I'm learning at church. You know, I'm telling her, hey, mom, you should memorize Philippians 2, 3, 2, A. And all of a sudden, the next day after, she memorized it. And then I started to get to know my mom. And to be honest, I know she's going to watch this. And I just wanted to honor her. Um, we may have been apart. But I just want to tell my mom, I've seen her grow. She be, she's teachable. She's teachable and I know she wants to grow with the Lord. And, and I'm really just thankful because I know God is restoring our relationship to this day. You know, when she's here, we spend time together. In fact, um, this photo that you see here on her 60th birthday, which was just like a few years ago, um, she celebrated her 60th year. Just, of course, she's already enjoying her grandchildren. I was longing for her to actually hear the word sorry to me from, since I was nine. And I was longing for that, but of course I've forgiven her. It doesn't matter if she say, says it or not because I've already seen the change. I've seen how she loves us, how she loves my husband and my children. But God really blessed me. On her birthday, she actually was the first time that she told me I'm sorry. So that's why saying sorry is, is really very important. It really just changes us to the core. And, to this day, you know, like, I can say I really love my mom, and my dad has now passed away seven years ago, but God also restored their relationship. But I just want to encourage moms, maybe you have older kids, like me, and you're still feeling like you had an awkward relationship with your children, or some of you children have don't have a close relationship with your parents or your mother, it's never too late. There's hope, if God can restore relationship, me and my mom, who have been separated for so so long, number of years, God can do the same for you. So that's a God we serve. Amen. So yeah, practical application on how we can spend time. Date your children individually. If you have many children, you can date them one by one, you know, because you can know them better. You, just do things they enjoy doing, know their, disli their likes and dislikes, know their strengths and weaknesses, and ask how you can improve. Sometimes it's hard, how can I improve? But it's okay because that's how we can learn, isn't it? So it's okay, you can ask your children. Um, so modeling, open communication, time, intimacy, four more to go. Vision. Vision is important. Right? It's always important to have a vision for our children because vision gives direction. In Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says, Without vision, the people perish. You know, growing up, sometimes when my children are sleeping or sometimes when I just look at them and I pray to God for them, I always pray that, and I pray, Lord, I pray that my children, you know, you will give them with talents and giftings and their lives will be really used to serve you. That's why we bring them, you know, we expose them to what we do, Bible studies, at church, you know, whatever we do when I'm talking to some people, I expose my kids to that. I'm praying that they too will have that compassion for the lost and compassion for the people of God. So, if you have a 
clear and grander vision, the greater the motivation. So we have to expect the best of our children, bring it out of them. If you see some strengths and talents, I know some of you, you see your kids doing what? They're really good in gymnastics or, you know, music, whatever. Just bring it out of them um, and be a dream releaser. I just wanted to show this example of this athlete. Her name is Wilma Rudolph. Wilma was actually born with a deformed limb, okay? She was the 20th of the 22 children, but she was born back. But you know, her family has a strong faith in God. And so they said, no, God can heal you. You can walk again. The doctor said, no, you can never walk again. But they had faith. All her siblings, brothers and sisters, they were massaging her legs, you know, taking turns just to, you know, make sure that it's well. And at the age of nine, she started to walk. And at the age of 13, she started to walk without braces. So, and then she said, no, I don't want to just walk. I want to run. And I want to run as fast as any woman could ever run. So, and that's what she did. In 1960, during the Olympics in Rome, Italy, she actually won three gold medals with a sprained ankle. Right? And then she, she, she was asked by the reporter, so, um, what is it? Who inspired you? She said, you know what? My biggest inspiration is my mother because she has a strong faith in God and, and my mom said, you know, with God all things are possible. The doctor said I will never walk again, but my mom said I, walk, I would and I believe my mother. So this is an example of how us as mothers can really bring out the best in our children. Don't say that, ah, oh, my kid, you know, but no, it takes time, be patient, but it will come out because the Bible says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Remember me? I wasn't really raised well by my parents or I wasn't really that hands-on. But look, God had a plan and purpose for my life. So here I am standing in front of you now. God is using me because God is a God who can give vision for us, isn't it? So praise God, yes. Um, vision. Okay, next. Affirmation. Positive words impact us positively. Negative words impact us negatively. Do you agree? Yes. Do you remember words spoken nicely about you? Do you remember them? But do you remember also words that are said negatively about you? Hurtful words. Sometimes we remember them the most. <laughs> That's the truth. Because you know when they say words can kill? It can really kill. Right? So the Bible says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So words are very important. Actually, they say, one correction, actually you should give five compliments. Because sometimes you always give correction, correction, correction. But maybe we can do that. One correction, five compliments. So they remember more. Um, some practical application, don't compare them with others. Sometimes we find that moms, right? Sometimes, how come, you know, her, her daughter's like this and mine's like this? So I think it's a dangerous trap to be in when we start comparing our kids with others because they're all different. They're all unique in God's way. They, God made them in such a way as that, so let's not try and do that. I know sometimes it get tempting, but pray and, and, and change and shift our minds. Um, don't label your children. I remember when I was preparing this message, I heard um, Dita Diona was actually giving this message as well. And she shared a story about her son, who was being asked, well, what's your name? And I said, nothing. It's like, where are you from? I'm from nowhere. So it's like that. So she was tempted to say, oh, I'm sorry, because my son is shy, or she's, he's this and that. But he deci she decided, no, I'll just talk to him in the house. So as I was hearing that, I said, guilty as charged. Because, you know, one of my daughters, um, she's actually a bit shy. Okay, and there are times when people will ask her and I go, oh, I'm so sorry. In front of her, I say, oh, I'm sorry, because she's really shy, she's really shy. So sometimes I hear that from Zoe, and then she'll say, oh, no, I'm shy, I'm shy. So she labeled herself yeah. as that, because I keep telling her that she's shy, she's shy, right? So then I, I realize, okay, I have to really be careful what I say or label my child. So mom's learning, I learned from it, so... Yeah, so you sandwich approach to correct, compliment good character, affirm through affection, affirm through love. So these are the ways we can do it. All right, last two. Last two, training. Okay, training involves teaching, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean, teaching isn't necessarily training, right? So when we say training, it's result, it should result in transformation. This is one of the, 
um, one of my favorite Bible verses that actually speak to us moms. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So even as young as they are, whether four months, Abby, you can start that young. And even if you're an older mom, you can still influence your children for God. We can still do this, right? And I think one thing, there's just different ways now. I think when, when they have different ages, so, you know, usually at my house, because we're trying to, you know, adopt this one command obedience. So basically, if he asks you to do it, one command. So other than that, you know, there's a bit of a consequence. So, but we're trying to develop that form of discipline. So for a while, I was doing this obedience jar. You know, I have coins where I put in some smiley faces. Every time they do good thing, jar. And then as soon as you get 10 smiley faces, you get this small price. So you can be as creative. Now we have these stickers on the wall. So I don't know. A lot of, you know, creative ideas that you can do. But of course, as they grow older, it becomes different as well. It's Sometimes it's giving up, um, not letting them do what they want to do, or like taking out the privileges as well. Sometimes it could be, what, YouTube or iPad or games, right? So these are the things, it changes as they grow. Um, so yeah, obedience is a foundation of training, because the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So as parents, we need to teach our children as early as now about obedience. Right, so that's really what we need to see in them. So how can we do that? Um, tell your child what to do and why. Show him how to do it or do it with him. It's really training. Like, you watch me, I do it, then you do it. And then later on, you do it, I'll watch you. And then later on, no, you do it on your own. So it's like really training them. Correct and encourage them. Let him practice it until it becomes a habit and make it enjoyable and possible. I like this quote, it actually says, until the child has learned and live out what you have taught, you have not trained. So until we see it in them. So let's not give up. Sometimes we think, ah, this kid of mine, I wonder when will it change? When will this happen? But it will happen, just don't give up on them. And lastly, so wait, hold on. Modeling, open communication, time, intimacy, Vision, affirmation, training, and lastly is entreaty. You might think, what's that? So such a heavy word. No, but it actually means entreaty or prayer, right? So prayer is, is very important because um, only God can really transform the hearts, isn't it? So prayer is key. So if you, we as parents, mothers, we want God to transform us, so it can begin with prayer. We can ask God, Lord, make me into a mother after your own heart. And then we can pray that God will also change the hearts of our children. It says here in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. So don't lose hope. You can pray. You know, it says, prayer is guaranteed panic prevention. Agree? <laughs> Prayer is guaranteed panic prevention. Because as moms, you agree, we worry a lot. What do we wear, worry sometimes? That they get sick, they, have, they get bullied in school, who will their husband will be, right? You know, all these things, you know, are they gonna finish school? Are they gonna grow up to love God? Are they gonna, you know, all these things we worry about. but. Really, the best thing we can really do for our children is as early as now is to pray for them. Correct? Right. You know, I'm going to share with you an example of someone who I've been really blessed because I've seen. Sorry, I just take this out. Okay, there you go. So yeah, hold on a second. It just says here, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person, including our children, and only God can fill that void and emptiness in us. So really the power of prayer is really key. I just wanted to share an example, um, actually a story from a good friend of mine who's also a good friend of some of you here, and her name is Ange. Ange is, um, he has this, she's, she's a mother of three, and Aiden, Who's, whom you see here in the photo is actually her youngest son. Okay, so but just to give you a background, Aiden actually has a 
rare genetic syndrome that affects several parts of his body. And it is characterized by developmental delays, heart abnormalities, feeding difficulties, increased tumor risk, and a range of orthopedic complications. So recently, actually to this day, Aidan is still in the hospital. I visited him a couple of times. But actually, I just wanted to honor this mother, who I believe is one of the strongest, strongest mothers I know. Sometimes I ask God and I tell God, Lord, can I take that? I don't think I can. You know, with her doing it 24-7, looking after her, her son and her child, she has two other kids. They have business to look after. But praise God, he has a wonderful husband who's really very supportive and really hands-on. But sometimes I take it, that pain and that worry and that panic that every single day you will have, it's just amazing. But I'm blown away because I've seen this couple's love for God, their faithfulness, and what keeps them strong. Aidan has a lot of prayer warriors, and some of you are probably here. But... And she's seen that photo. That's her heart. She was just really pouring heart, her heart to God. In fact, she texted me this morning. She said, I've really been kneeling before God in prayer for my son. And my heart is that, Lord, you grant her heart's desire that they will come out of that hospital sooner rather than later. So maybe we can take that time sometime tonight before we end to pray for them. Because Aidan is truly a special child of God. I love that photo. It's his father who made that. He's made perfect in weakness. So that's a photo when I, I had the privilege of praying for him. And I remember, you know, I mentioned this to Ash, to her mom. You know, Aidan somehow has a special place in my heart. The fact that he has the same birthday as Zoe as well. So, you know, that, that already speaks to me. But also, for some reason, every time I pray for this child, God always gives me this verse, Luke 166, that says, what will this child turn out to be? For some, because God's, for the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. So I know that God is using Aidan and his testimony to really bless people. But I also know that the life of Ange and his, her husband, Ayan, is being used by God because they're showing what it means to really believe God and believe in his word and really claim the promises of God for, his, for their son. So, yeah, so that's it. Power of prayer, ladies. Because it says when we work, we work. But when God, but when we pray, God works. So power of prayer. You have maybe you have certain issues with your children. Maybe you think I don't really have that relationship with my son or my daughter. You know, my son is or my child is really going away this path. How I wish he's going this path. Sometimes it's just beyond our control, isn't it? But what can we do is to pray and really kneel before God and say, Lord, yes. you know, I really need your help. Apart from you, I cannot do it. So why don't we do that and really take the time to pray for our children? In closing, Ruth Bell Graham, um, you know him, you know, probably know her. You know Billy Graham, right? The greatest evangelist ever. This is his wife, Ruth Bell Graham. I just particularly love this this um, quote by one of her daughters that talks about the heart of Ruth. And this is what she said. This is Anne, who's the daughter of Ruth. And she said, I believe that her heavenly father, our savior, saved my mother from loneliness because of her daily walk with the Lord Jesus. He was the love of her life. I saw that in her life. It was, it was her love for the Lord Jesus with who she walks every day that made me want to love him and walk with him like that. Wow. So moms, I really pray that as we end tonight, you know, God brought you here because he wants us to improve us and become moms after God's own heart. Um, don't worry if we've made mistakes because we all learn from it, isn't it? But what's important is what's ahead. How we can go forward, how we can develop that, um, influence our children by doing the motivate, the acronym motivate. Um, but it really begins with the heart. Similar to Ruth Graham, you know, she understood the love of the Lord. Because the Bible does say, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. So even God, He loves us that much that He actually had to give His Son for us because He loves us. And He's saying here, And to whoever who believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. God wants us to have that intimate relationship with us. And it begins with opening our hearts to Him, believing in who Jesus is. Because His promise is He will change our hearts 
and he will change the hearts of our children. This morning, I was having my quiet time, and I read this verse, and I said, that's perfect. I wanted to share it to, to you tonight. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, God is saying, I would not forget you. See, I have written your name on the palm of my hands. Always in my mind is a picture of Jerusalem's walls ruins. So, I don't think we'll ever forget our child, right? That we're nursing. But God is saying, even if that's possible, I will not forget you. See, I have written your name on the palm of my hands. And tonight, ladies, God is saying, I want to actually write your name on the palm of my hands. And it begins by opening your heart and asking God to really surrender your life and say, Lord, you know what? I don't really know how to be, to mother or parent my child. I don't really know how to do it. But I'm asking you with your help to please change me first and foremost so that I can influence my child for you. So why don't we close in prayer and I'll lead you in a prayer. Um, some of you here, that's probably the desire of your heart is to say that, Lord, yes, I would like to accept you. I would like to accept you in my heart. I would like you to be the one to change my heart and make me to the kind of mother, the kind of woman, the kind of daughter that you want me to be. And I know that it begins with you, first and foremost, changing me. So tonight, ladies, if that's you, I would like you to pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart. There's no magic to this prayer, because really God knows exactly what's in your heart. So if this is a prayer of your heart to really accept Jesus in your life, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you love me. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me because you love me. Lord, I'm sorry for all the things that I have done which are not pleasing to you. I ask you now, Lord, to change me and make me to the kind of woman that you want me to be. I cannot do this on my own. I need you, Lord, to help me and to guide me to become the mother after your own heart. And I pray that you will help me to do it, Lord, and really help my children to do the same. So thank you, Lord, for your gift of salvation. I ask this in Jesus' name. And for those of you mothers, I would like to pray for all of you. Lord, thank you, God, Jesus, for all the mothers whom you have brought tonight. Father, I know it is indeed a privilege that you have chosen us, Lord God, to become mothers, to look after the children whom you have brought to us. Father, there are times when it's really hard work. It's painful. Sometimes it can get very overwhelming. But Lord, we recognize that without you, Lord, if we're operating in our own selves, we cannot do it. So we're just asking you, Lord, to please empower each and every woman here, Lord, mother here tonight. Lord, may you give them a fresh start, a new beginning. Lord, may you restore relationships with their children. May we restore relationships with their husbands. And Lord, use them, Lord, to be the greatest influence, Lord, to their children, to love you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, give us, Lord, a new heart. And Lord, let it begin with having a heart that's pleasing and honoring to you. And Lord, right now, I'd just like to pray a special prayer for Merlin and Sarah. Thank you for their life testimony. Thank you, Lord, for their example of how you can restore relationships. And Lord, that nothing is impossible to you. I pray that you will continue to grow their relationship. Lord, as mother, daughter, that you will continue to provide for their needs and protect them as well. Lord, we also remember, Lord, and... Lord God, and Aidan, who is in the hospital right now. Father, in unity, Lord, we cry before you. Lord, as mothers, our hearts ache for them as well. Lord, but we know that you are God. You are the greatest doctor. You're the greatest healer, and nothing is impossible with you. That your plans, Lord, for Aidan will prosper, and that it will come true, Lord, as you have said in your word. I pray, Lord, that you will just guide all the doctors, that you will allow, allow Aiden, Lord, to come out of the hospital soon, Lord, so he can spend time, Lord, at home and enjoy her, his time with his siblings, his parents, his grandmother. And Lord, I pray, Lord, most importantly for Ian and Ash, Lord, that you just continue to strengthen their faith, to strengthen, Lord, their faith in you, Lord, that they will never give up, that they will continue to kneel down before you, pleading for their son. Because, Lord, I know that you're ultimately just wanting our hearts, first and foremost. So we thank you, Lord. Again, Lord, we thank you for a beautiful night tonight. What a beautiful time it is, Lord, to be together with my fellow moms. Lord, I just pray for blessing upon each family here represented. Lord, may you be honored. May you be glorified. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.